CX is the team that is the eyes and ears inside your brand. So if you have like a magnificent campaign, they will be the first one to receive the praises and like read yeah. the fabulous feedback. And if something goes wrong or like your clients don't like it, they will be the first ones to hear as well. You're listening to CX Passport, the show about creating great customer experiences with a dash of travel talk. Each episode, we'll talk with our guests about great CX, travel, and just like the best journeys, explore new directions we never anticipated. I'm your host, Rick Denton. I believe the best meals are served outside and require a passport. Let's get going. Welcome back, CX Passport Travelers. Today we get to head to a new destination, which is always exciting for me. Today, for the first time, we have a guest from Argentina, which is also a country I've not had the chance to see yet. Now, soon, I hope. Meet Mili Gonzalez, a brand, business, and content specialist with over nine years of expertise, navigating what is an incredibly complex landscape of national and multinational companies. Mili currently steers the ship as the ambassador marketing manager at Gorgeous, where innovation meets personalized support in this vast sea of e-commerce. Before Gorgeous, Mili showcased her strategic prowess at Social Native, donning the hat of senior content curation manager. Managing content curation strategies for over 20 accounts in the EMEA region. Now, you're hearing that global reach again. She orchestrated the perfect symphony between brands and user generated content, ensuring that only the best made it to the forefront for campaigns and launches. Mealy's global experience doesn't stop there, having served at Alicorp as the international business development manager. Responsible for five brands all across Latin America, Mealy orchestrated 360 degree growth projects, both from concept all the way to product development ensuring this seamless customer experience. I came to know Mealy through a former CX Passport guest, Zoe Khan, episode 143. If you haven't already, be sure and go have a listen to her episode as it was absolutely fantastic. Travelers, get ready for an enlightening conversation with Mealy Gonzalez as she shares insights, experiences, and strategies that have shaped her journey in the ever-evolving landscape of customer experience. Mealy, welcome to CX Passport. Thank you so much for that amazing presentation. That might have been the best presentation of my whole life. Thanks so much. Well, well good. All right. Episode <laughs> over. We're just going to end it here. That's great. We'll publish it. Uh, listeners, I hope you enjoyed the show. But no, Mealy, there's way too much that you know that I want to learn from and I want our listeners to learn from as well. It, there's something that you said when you and I first met. And I didn't go deep then because I wanted to explore it here in the show. You mentioned that we're in this midst of a transition from knowledge to experience. I'm really curious, what did you mean by that? And how does that influence the practice of customer experience today? Yeah, like I think like truism is really, you can really put that in practice when you get into experience. I think like in this era, it's all about the experience and not so much about the educational background. And I think we're going to see that evolving even more in the upcoming generations. Like it's all about the experience that you had, what you can bring to the table and not about that much about the papers that can back you up. Like that's the, really like I feel it's been changing for the last like probably 10 years or so. So I didn't remember I say that, but <laughs> that really speaks to my, to, to what I believe in. So, yeah. Well, and, and Mealy, one of the things that, uh, impressed me when we were first meeting is exactly that, that I didn't get the sense of calculated. It wasn't, okay, here are the points that I want to care. These are just the, the phrases that flowed from you. So if, if we're thinking about both the delivery of customer experience, those of us that are in the customer experience space or those of us that are around the customer experience space, and if we think of customers, if that's true, if the check of a, a particular document or a degree or a certification is not as important as, ex as the experience that someone has gained. How does that then influence the delivery of customer experience? Yeah, I think like the, 
being able to we i think we also talk about how important is empathy in inside customer experience and that customer experience world like we have to empathize with our clients journey and understand what they are going through what they are looking for when they come to our brands to look for our products so i think like being able to put on these people's shoes and understand their needs and actually being there and answering their questions and providing solutions even before they know, like even before they have the, the questions. Um, yeah, that is what makes a true great experience for the client, right? Like make it smooth, make it easy, make it yeah. approachable, um, make it like not rigid, right? Like we all have, like every company have policies uh, and that's great. <laughs> we all need like a framework and a structure to know like where, how can we be flexible, but there's all, very important to be able to be flexible and to have yeah. judgment. And that's why we have like, at the end of the day, we have like a person behind, uh, behind support, right? Like right. with AI right now being so relevant in the conversation and like so many people like, I think that we're a little over that, but be, people being afraid of like losing their job. We talk about this as well, like how like Proval CX is going to be one of the last jobs that can be replaced because at one point to be able to solve problems, you need that person behind to be able to understand, to make the questions and to make decisions that are out of policy. So I think let's. Like, mm -hmm. Oh, no, keep going. Sorry. I, 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 listeners, we have a lag between Argentina and the U.S. It happens. <laughs> Mealy, keep going with your flow. Yeah, Sorry about that. And so that's why, like, the true CX is like a human experience and it's just empathizing yeah. and that's the human factor of, of CX. This is your captain speaking. I want to thank you for listening to CX Passport today. We've now reached our cruising altitude, so I'll turn that seatbelt sign off. <laughs> While you're getting comfortable, hit that follow or subscribe button on your favorite podcast app so you'll never miss an episode. Love it if you'd tell a friend about CX Passport, leave a review so others can discover the show as well. Now, sit back and enjoy the rest of the episode. Okay, let's let's talk about that. There's some, there's something else I want to ask you, but I'm going to skip that for a second because I want to get into this this focus on that empathy you're describing, that humanity, that flexibility. You and I are very aligned when it comes to placing an emphasis on the front line. I've heard you say that the customer service, the, the customer service role, the front line is undervalued. If everything that you just said about empathy, all that is so important, why do you think the front line is still today so undervalued? It's, it's true. It's true. Like I find that CX is the team that is the eyes and ears inside your brand. So if you have like a magnificent campaign, they will be the first one to receive the praises and like read yeah. the fabulous feedback. And if something goes wrong or like your clients don't like it, they will be the first ones to hear as well. So oh, they will. <laughs> only, they are not only like a support um, and problem solving role they also have a lot of feedback and a lot of insights from the customers but i think just right now founders are like shifting their perspective and giving like a proper seat to cx on like the directory table and to make decisions because actually cx inside the company is the voice of the customers so if you want to have like a customer centric culture that we all talk about this and all brands want to be customer centric, you actually need to give a space to, to CX in those decisions because they will be able, they will be the ones to be able to speak uh, your customer's mind because they are the ones that are right there. I want to, I definitely want to go back to something that you said in there. And it is this this idea that the front line is the one that knows. They're the ones that have that insight. And you may have seen me grinning from ear to ear because it is so true that when something and, and especially in some of the companies like when we were talking with Zoe and it was the direct to consumer where that is the interface. There's not an intermediary re, uh, retailer at certain points. And hearing from that, whether it's the contact center, whether it's social media, where it's that the, the people that are on that front line they're co-creating customer experience. How have you seen companies make that move from viewing the contact center as this cost center 
to a customer insight center, like you're describing a revenue generator? How are you seeing companies make that move? Exactly. So, so actually like Gorgeous, I now work for Gorgeous, like we uh, provide like unlimited seats in our platform. So people from all different areas in the company can have access to the tickets, the, the feedback that clients are, um, are leaving for the company. So that way, like they can access like good feedback, bad feedback, reviews, everything. And the question is, what are you going to do with that feedback? Are you going to use it? Are you going to use it in your decision-making process? Or are you just going to let it sit there and actually don't listen to your customers? So right now through this role, I have the possibility to, to actually talk and interview many CX leaders in the space like Zoe. Uh, she's a great partner. I love her so much. And in like Amanda from Love Wellness, the ex director of Love Wellness, for example, she was sharing about her experience with one of their products. I think it was called something like Lean Queen or something similar. Don't quote me on that one. Um, All right. Uh, but I think it was that, uh, and like he, they received like a lot of feedback from customers saying like, you know what, like we feel like this makes us feel that only tiny people or small people could access this like feeling good or wellness um, condition. So they listened to that feedback and they were actually able to change the name of the product. So that have like a lot oh. of consequences, right? You have to change if you have like inventory for packaging, if you had like the design, if you have everything up on their website to make that sale, but being able to listen to your customers and provide a solution or like an alternative that is more aligned to your values and the experience you want to provide to your customers, that is like, that is the ultimate CX, um, CX moment, right? So the CX support is like, uh, you don't have to buy that insights anymore. Like back in the days, we would go to focus groups. We will <laughs> go visit people in their homes and like ask them questions. And we know how much distortion there was on those answers. But nowadays, yeah. all you need to do is read your reviews, go into your support platform, read those tickets and understand what's the experience that your customers are having and understanding how you can make it better. And like the great thing is like it's not always a budget restriction. Like you don't need to break the bank to make a great CX. You actually just need to care for your customers, actually care. You're, you're, you're talking about this, this movement from insight to action. And I, I talk a lot about that, that it, so what if you have insights? Heck, I, I talk about, you know, so what if you have scores, right? Oh, yay, our score went up. Oh, boo, our score went down. Well, well you need to understand at the insights. You're talking about that next stage, right? And that is the action associated with it. You've been exposed to a lot of companies. You mentioned that with Amanda uh, and, and her role in pivoting to action. When you see companies do it right, I imagine there's a lot of process discipline there. There's a lot of execution discipline there. How have you seen if it's the CX director or the, whoever is leading this kind of this interface at, at Gorgeous, who, how are you seeing them influence the company to move to action, to actually do something to, in your example, to change the name of a product? There's a lot that goes into that. How do getting that motion forward, that buy-in, how do you, how have you seen that be successful? Yeah. So like, for example, there's another great brand, Canadian brand hash out there. And they're one of their core values. They have been like talking to their customers in order to design their next products. So I think like I, I, I view their story like after almost going into bankruptcy and like almost close to having to close the company, they like reach out to their customers, those customers that have like bought several times from them and ask them, okay, what do you want from this product? If we were to launch this next product, what do you want for uh, out of this? And they call, they make the questions, they listen, and then they take that feedback from their customers, people that have already bought, that they love the brand, that like they believe in them. There's already a relationship there and put all of that feedback in the product design. That is the perfect way, right? To to actually have that customer centric culture and having that lead your decisions. It is, it's certainly great when you already have that in place. I, I know that I, I 
have worked with, I've consulted CX leaders and, and helped them in organizations that don't necessarily have that buy-in. I want to ask you about the tickets that you talk about it. And inside of each of those tickets, there's a story there. And, and so either the tickets themselves or just beyond that, how are you seeing the, the, those, the unlocking of eagerness to move forward with CX uh -huh. out of something like a ticket? Using those customer stories, where have you seen that be successful? So actually this year, I also had the pleasure to work with Eli Wise. And he, like right now, he's- a Another guest. CX Passport guest. Another CX Passport <laughs> guest. Uh, and so he was talking about like, for example, someone um, bought like a, a Father's Day present, right? And it's like, where is the present? And you offer them a refund. Right, like they are telling you right. that, that it is that birth, like a Father's Day present or the birthday, and they want, like, they don't want a refund. They don't want no, like, no. They want that present to arrive and to make it better. Right. So, in like that's why a human is necessary behind the screen to assess that ticket and say, okay, this one needs special care. Like, what alternative mm -hmm. can I give to this customer, especially if it's a customer that have come back several times you know you want to retain that customer and how can i provide a solution that actually satisfies the needs of this customer so it's just that it's just reading and paying attention or like for example changing like actually if you change a bad review into a positive review like the chances you're going to keep that this one is going to be a brand ambassador for your brand um it's like, absolutely. I, like, this is like another CX lead in my ambassador program. I'm so proud of it. Kaela Castillo from Jackson. She was also talking about how she was turning like bad reviews into five star reviews. And I think that is the game of retention, right? We all know like lifetime value is so important and how difficult is to acquire one customer. So once you acquire them, once you got them to go into your webpage, you got them to purchase your product, if you can retain them and make them like a loyal customer of your brand, that is what you want to keep. Like you want to retain them and that's only through great CX. Mealy, I love that and I, I... I've told brands, or I've said this, I think I've said this on this show that there's almost a temptation to say, hey, why don't you disappoint a few customers so that you can restore their relationship and make it great again? Well, no, that's a bad idea. No, we never want to seek to disappoint, yet what you said is so true. And I would like to, uh, maybe off air, we're, I would love for you to introduce me so that we can hear more of those stories of the the turnaround. The, the, the That opportunity to totally restore the relationship can create such a sense of loyalty. You know, an area that has a lot of opportunity to restore relationships is travel, right? You've, you've traveled the globe. There have been a lot of long flights. There's been a lot of hard trips. And one of the things that can be very nice on a long trip is to stop down in the lounge, take a little break in the, the lounge, enjoy a snack, enjoy a drink. And so today I want to invite you to do that. No drink, no snack. I'm sorry. I don't have that through the, uh, the, the video screen here, but I'd like you to join me here in the first class lounge. And let's have a little fun here. I'm curious, what is a dream travel location from your past? From my past, so that I that I have been already. That's correct. Um, so Italy. Last year, I had the chance to spend three weeks in Italy um, <sighs> with my sister, another half of the trip with my friends, and it was really a great destination. Italy. What a wonderful place. I can see why that is the dream from your past. And to be able to spend three weeks there, that's really nice to do a little slower travel uh, and probably inspired you like Italy travel has inspired me to want to spend three months, three years there and really slow travel it for sure. What about going forward? What is a dream travel location you've not been to yet? I haven't been to the Polynesia Islands. I would love to oh, go yeah. or like even Hawaii. I haven't had the chance to go. So definitely I think that side of the world really calls me. Boy, that would be nice. It is it, it, getting out there would be delightful. Now, listeners, if you are a listener 
you don't know this, but if you're a viewer, you may wonder, well, wait, why is Rick wearing a sweater and why is Mealy wearing summer clothes? That's right, folks. She gets to make us all jealous down there in Argentina in the summer weather. And so uh, while I am thinking of beaches and wanting to get out there because it's cold, I see that Mealy uh, Beach is just a part of your culture and wanting to get out to Polynesian Hawaii is just part of probably who you are and wanting to get out there. I have to call it out, though. I am jealous of your summer time frame right now and, uh, and, and wish that I were in a warmer place right now. What is, we talked about Italy, and mm -hmm. one of the great things about it is the food, but I don't want to lead you with that. In general, what is a favorite thing of yours to eat? Yeah, I would have to say seafood, definitely, yes. So I live in Argentina, but I don't know if you know that, but I'm actually from Peru. I'm from Peruvian, so I love mm -hmm. my Peruvian seafood. I love ceviche and all the goodies, Yes, that is that is awesome. Yes, I have. Uh, I was actually really impressed by the the seafood, which obviously Peru there being on the coast and the seafood culture, um, the the sushi culture is spectacular there. It is really a delightful seafood culture. So I can see why that would be a part of yours. Let's go the other direction. What is something while you were growing up you were forced to eat, but you hated as a kid? <sighs> yeah, like yes, I. Like all of this liver, I had to, like my mom what, want, always wanted me to eat liver because I was so like skinny and like didn't eat that much. <laughs> that I could, like she tried to give it to me in all different kind of ways, like in soup, like Milanese, like no, I just like I could try it a little bit and I already knew that there was liver on that dish and I couldn't make it. No, never. <laughs> Mealy, there's a there's a bit of a in, a host insider smile. One, I just love the the story, but I am blown away by how often liver is coming up. Listeners, you'll realize that yeah, the episode before this one, what was the answer to the food? Uh huh, liver and onions. So it is it is funny how this is coming up as a theme. I have stumbled into I thought it was Brussels sprouts was the world's most hated, but I'm starting to realize it may be liver and onions that is the most hated. Let's let's close out the lounge with travel, Amelia. You have had the chance to travel the globe. You're all over the place. What is one travel item you won't leave home without, not including your passport, not including your phone? That's a great question. I think like my sunblock. I am um, like I cannot leave my. I need it every day. Um, I love being outdoors and outside and enjoy the sun, but yeah, um, have to take care of our skin. <laughs> so yes, yeah, sunblock is the one that I will definitely bring. A wise choice, Mealy, especially as I reinforce again in summer. Um, I did have a, it's not Argentina, of course, but I have told a story where I was in Brazil on a project in winter while, I'm sorry, well, summer in Brazil, winter back home. And it was nice to report back that I was sunburned on the beach while my home friends were enjoying ice and snowstorms. So yes, sunblock does matter a lot. We talked a lot about the success stories, companies that have made that successful move, either leveraging their customer insights, uh, moving to action, really making changes as a result. It's, it's obvious to people like you and me that it matters, that this is something that creates tangible business value. We know it, yet we see plenty of examples of customer experience, customer service, all sorts of scenarios where it's still not great out there. There's a lot of things that are still need improvement. Why do you think that is? Why do you think companies haven't fully embraced the need to embrace the front line, the insights, the action around improving customer experience? I think because they haven't noticed the potential of customer support and customer experience. They are still seeing these as a cost center. Like they, this is just returns. These are just cancellations. These are just mm -hmm. reinvestment and they haven't tap into the potential to turn this from a cost center to a revenue center, like turn a cancellation to an upsell. And that is happening every time more and more. So I think it's just like a change on the perspective and a change on the vision that sometimes that is the most difficult thing to do, right? Like, and I think that's one thing that CX leaders struggle in, in their organizations when the founders are not there yet and are not seeing that great opportunity 
uh, from customer support. And like the key for this is to show the numbers, right? Like this is how much sales we generated from support. Like we can, like in Gorgeous, we can provide all of those statistics. And we always encourage uh, CX leaders to show their performance and show what's the revenue that the business that I, they can bring to the company with these numbers, with, yeah. Uh, data to back up the decisions and to get more more budgets to keep investing in customer experience. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm definitely a big proponent. And, and there's actually it's it's kind of a debate in the customer experience world. And and I respect actually the other side of this view. I'm more still on the side of we still need to show the dollars. We we still need and and it's kind of like marketing. Sometimes you can't directly tied to it, but still some sort of linkage to, look, if we do this, we achieve this result and it will re create this revenue gain or we'll reduce this cost or whatever that looks like, a tangible business result. I do understand the other perspective that is, hey, look, HR doesn't have to justify their existence. Why does CX? And I, th I think it comes down to the the maturity of the the discipline and still the fact that right now CX is something that, well, <laughs> uh, I guess legally you got to keep your HR department, but you don't have to keep your customer experience department. And so I think we're still on that side of proving the results. And then another sort of way of proving the results is sort of doing it yourself. And I'm kind of curious. I'm curious about Gorgeous itself. On the internal perspective, you have a whole suite of, of customers. Gorgeous has its customers as well. You may be helping them with their customers. But if you're offering this leadership to clients on how to listen and act, how does Gorgeous listen to its own customers and act on what you learn? Yes, that's a great question. Actually, in Gorgeous, we have a, pro, a program that is called like CSM a client. So we like like um, collaborators from different areas, we are incentivized to pick a brand and to CSM their accounts. I personally did it, did that this quarter with a couple of my partners, and that has been like a great experience to actually understand how they are using the platform, how they can get it better, understand why they want to, they are asking for some features or why they want to make some changes or why they find it confusing. Where are our areas of opportunities? I think, um, yeah, I think it's a really valuable program. So everyone, like if you are in legal or you are in marketing, you are in ops, like everyone is encouraged to see a SEMA product, um, a brand. And I think that, yeah, that has been great just to feel more comfortable with the platform, like what we are offering, what are our like strength, where we, do we need to improve? So, so yeah. And also- like, Do you- Oh no, keep going, keep going. Also- from the from an example actually from Amanda from Love and Wellness, they have like this program that everyone does customer support on I don't know if it's monthly basis or yearly basis, but everyone get a chance to answer tickets and listen mm -hmm. to to those requests. I think that is really important as well. Also to value the CX uh, agents as well like we haven't talked about how draining can it be because at the end of the day yes you receive praises and good feedback as well but most of the time you will need like you will need to help people with their issues with their purchase right sometimes yeah. these are full of emotion sometimes these yeah. are full of <laughs> And this, like the CX agent have to be there and like be kind and be helpful and try to solve this person problem. So I think that program in Love Wellness is a great program as well, just to show appreciation to your CX team and understand the valuable job that they are doing. That is, uh, I, I have this memory. Well, there's two memories that are coming to mind. One is it's not exactly a, a, a the customer service age. And I don't even know if this brand still does this. But I knew there was a time that 7-Eleven would for its executive team, and I don't know exactly where the line was drawn on the hierarchy, but before you could start your role, you had to perform X number of months in a 7-Eleven store. You extracted yourself from the headquarters and you worked in an actual store. And you want to talk about really understanding what your – and at that time, your customers are your franchisees. They're not just your customers, right? So your franchisees, your customers, what they're experiencing by, my gosh, being in the store. Same thing with your example of being there on the front lines. Uh, I was working for a former company, and I remember a an executive coming down and, and working the phones. And the conversation with that executive after the fact was, that's exhausting. 
I never want to do that. And he didn't mean this, like, I never want to do that again, just sort of being exhausted. What he meant, though, was he could, he absolutely valued and felt like he was under skilled to deliver on what the the agents are, which often we see the agents perhaps as a, a different level on the hierarchy, when really we should be flipping that hierarchy and perhaps at the co-creation of experience, that's where you should have the highest value applied to. It is eye-opening when an executive, and forget executive, let's take that word out of it. When anyone actually takes a customer phone call. Yes. Mila, have, have you seen any chat? challenges with that uh as far as like are, are people afraid to say the wrong thing like if, if i'm a company right now and i hear this episode and i'm thinking great i want my leadership team on the phones what do i need to watch out for what do i need to make sure that i do so that they have a successful experience and the customers have a successful experience uh, I think like what we talked about, like the framework is important. Know what, where are your limits? What are your policies? And in what cases you can be flexible? I think with that framework, you should be able to to navigate the CX world um, with a lot of like common sense, logic, and empathy. I think those are keys. Can we talk about that a little bit to finish out, Mealy? Uh, I'm looking at the clock. Uh, I'm going to cheat and get, run us maybe a little bit long here. You started by talking about policies and, and breaking uh, or, or giving flexibility there. That's scary for a company. Uh, Zoe's ep episode actually is called the one with the profitable rule breaker. And her point was, hey, by allowing people to you know think like humans, you can actually increase your profits by allowing this. If, if you're having a conversation with one of your clients and they're a policy heavy client and you're saying, hey, look, you need to be more flexible. How do you help guide them to to feel safe there? How do you guide them to feel comfortable going to that empowered, human oriented approach? I think information and data is really valuable at this point. And that's another reason why Gorgias is so great. When you receive one of your clients ticket, you get to see the history of this client. So you get to see if they have purchased many times before you get to see the tickets that they got before. Maybe this is a person that always wants to return something. So, you know, with, oh, yeah. like, who you are handling with. Maybe this is a person that have regularly bought for you for several years, or you need to break a policy, you should do it because this is one of your loyal clients. So I think information, like if you go blinded to make a decision and that one email is the only thing you have, yes, probably policy, it's the right way to go because also there is people that want to break that always are finding like a gap in the system and how to take <laughs> advantage of it and how right. to, you know, like there's always so that, but if you have information and history on these clients, you should be able to, to make an informed decision and be able to, to break a policy without breaking up, breaking the bank. Right. I like that. Ooh, let's close there. That's fantastic. Mealy, if, if First of all, I love that because it's not just, yeah, willy nilly, we trust people, but rather with information, you can then empower and trust because you've informed your front line. Love it. Amelia, if folks wanted to get to know more about you and your approach to customer experience, learn more about Gorgeous and the products that they offer, what's the best way for folks to get to learn more? Definitely through LinkedIn. Uh, you can find me there through like my full name, actually, that it's Milagros Gonzalez. Um, yeah, so in LinkedIn, I'm always sharing like great content from the ambassadors, great insights. So that will be the best place to connect with me. Awesome. I will get that into the show notes uh, with uh, Mili's full name and you'll be able to just click that link and go there. Mili, thank you for walking me through this conversation. This has been a lot of fun going, understanding, especially because I love talking to someone who has the same value on the front line that recognizes that's where it matters. That's where it's really, that's the goal. That's the insight and some ideas on how a company might be able to move from viewing them as a cost center and actually into actual insights. And those success stories that you've shared have, should have inspired listeners and viewers. I know it inspired me. And I'm hoping that through that, we will start to see fewer and fewer of these bad customer experiences, bad customer service, and instead see more and more delightful and forget delightful, just good experience with our brands. Mealy, it was a wonderful ride today. Thank you for being on CX Passport. Thank you so much for having me, Rick. This was a pleasure.
Thanks for joining us this week on CX Passport. If you liked today's episode, I have three quick next steps for you. Click subscribe on the CX Passport YouTube channel or your favorite podcast app. Next, leave a comment below the video or a review in your favorite podcast app so others can find and enjoy CX Passport too. Then head over to cxpassport.com for show notes and resources that can help you create tangible business results by delivering great customer experience. Until next time, I'm Rick Denton, and I believe the best meals are served outside and require a passport. Passport.